So when it comes to things like um, genomic risk profiling, that's being used more to guide therapy in things like ALL, how do you see the role of molecular and cytogenetic risk evolving in clinical decision making? And are there subgroups that you've come across that might benefit from more tailored approaches like this? Well, up to now, uh, much of the risk assessment that we do with these molecular genetic tests is based on results that we've gotten in patients who've gotten chemotherapy. And um, we can categorize patients as having more favorable risk, genetic abnormalities, sometimes intermediate, and then unfavorable. And the unfavorable patients obviously don't tend to do as well with chemotherapy. So in the past, we've always felt that those patients should be uh, considered for a bone marrow transplant, even if they have a good response to chemotherapy and become MRD negative, where we can't find any evidence of leukemia. We're still worried that there's leukemia cells hiding there that could cause a relapse. Now, that's changing somewhat with uh, the introduction of immunotherapy, immune therapy approaches, which seem, which is looking like we're going to be able to overcome some of those um, uh, unfavorable genetic abnormalities. And we're starting to think that maybe not all those patients necessarily need to have a transplant if they get treated with immunotherapy and become MRD negative. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about just the concept overall. I'm um, speaking of, you know, pediatrics or younger younger patients. Um, I came across just in some of your, your writing a mentions of the adoption of pediatric-inspired in intensive chemotherapy regimens in young adults um, to improve outcomes in ALL. Um, what are the most important considerations when adapting these regimen for older or high-risk adult patients? Well, it's to know that the pediatric regimens, now they, the, the big difference between the pediatric regimens and the adult regimens are that the pediatric regimens use much more of what we call non-myelosuppressive uh, drugs, so drugs that don't cause the blood counts to go down as low. And those are steroids, a drug called vincristine, and then a drug called L-asparaginase. Mm. So those are used in more frequently and in higher doses in the pediatric regimens. But in young adults, they don't tend to tolerate those as well, so they can have more side effects, more complications from those. So that's an important consideration to be aware of that and carefully monitor those patients. Probably as, as well as the pediatric patients or more, uh, should, they should be carefully monitored using those regimens. So they're not, they're not easy regimens to get the patients through. We can get them through them, but it takes a lot of careful care. And what strategies do you find most effective for monitoring and managing treatment-related toxicities, specifically hepatic and neuropsychiatric effects? Well, it's it's uh, an important one is frequent follow-up. Um, so we have to help our <clears throat> excuse me help our patients be compliant, show up for their appointments, and and uh, show up to have the testing that we need to do uh, uh, to make sure that. We're carefully monitoring those things. Um, there's different approaches that have been taken to assess the ne neurologic and psychiatric effects, even something called a writing test where they they write a phrase every week and we can see if that their handwriting is deteriorating. That could be a sign of a neurologic problem. So those kinds of things are important. Mm 